Thank you so much, Elena. It's uh, wonderful to be here um, at Stanford, uh, at the Graduate School of Education here. Um, uh, I, I used to teach until last July at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and, and there's always been a lot of kind of friendly contact uh, uh, between the, our two schools of education on uh, two opposite sides of the country. Um, now I'm uh, back at NYU, where I uh, kind of grew up professionally, but um, today I'm going to talk um, First, a little bit of introduction around uh, a current effort, and I'm actually going to ask you for your feedback um, and input because uh, the a current set of um, uh, global development goals and associated targets and indicators are open for public comment out of this organization. I'll tell you a little bit about the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, but then I'm going to talk a little bit um, about two research projects uh, um, one in Chile and one in Massachusetts um, that are about how this question of how can we implement um, a particular aspect of early childhood development policies, um, early childhood education, which has been in uh, quite a lot in the news lately with uh, initiatives for universal preschool that you might have heard about from uh, President Obama. Um, as well as Mayor Bill de Blasio, uh, who ran on this issue as the top issue in his campaign in New York City and, and one that he is now uh, moving towards. So, um, but this issue of large-scale early childhood education, um, a, a intervention that a lot of people talk about as having a potential to reduce um, in educational inequality, how can we implement it with quality at scale, um, both in uh, countries outside the U.S. and um, inside the U.S.? So, um, so this first part, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of um, setting the goals for post-2015 global development. So um, a lot of this uh, uh, is stuff that uh, I think you, you know. Uh, the thesis of this current work and why it's urgent is that uh, we're living in a world that is uh, really moving in the wrong direction as far as both environmental sustainability but also human sustainability and the ability of um, the next generation to really fulfill their potential. Um, and so, uh, of course, our little corner of it or my little corner of it um, uh, uh, is around education and the role that education can play, but this is really the larger context of a world that's in crisis. So um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network is a UN-affiliated network um, that is providing advice into a current process of defining what the, the UN member nations, which comprises about 192 nations uh, around the world, um, what their common agreed upon goals should be for the period from 2015 to 2030. Right now we're in the 2000 to 2015 period and there has been a set of millennium development goals that have been the global development goals for um, the UN uh, countries uh, since 2000. Um, and so now many countries around the world and there's a kind of a, a, a big uh, complicated political process to define what the global development goals should be for 2015 to 2030. Um, ours is the only network that is uh, research and evidence based to try to bring the, the best science that we have on sustainable development to the definition of this next set of goals that would be for 2015 to 2030. Um, this network is directed by Professor Jeff Sachs, who's a well-known um, development economist at Columbia. And there are 12 thematic groups that are working on particular themes of global development. So uh, <laughs> we are supporting a, a committee of the UN countries that's called the Open Working Group on post-2015. Um, and uh, each of the thematic groups, roughly speaking, is associated with one global goal. Um, and uh, part of our work is not simply to propose the post-2015 goals with indicators that would be essentially the benchmarks um, that would guide uh, uh, country policies, um, but to also <coughs> develop interventions and solutions that uh, are innovations to, um, in collaboration with stakeholders from a variety <coughs> of sectors. Um, and finally, there is an initiative for a global online university for sustainable development. 
So um, this is uh, the proposed set of sustainable development goals from our group. The idea is that um, all need to be addressed and that if uh, one is taken out, um, that would actually threaten um, all of them uh, because all of these issues, uh, as we know, are interrelated. Um, poverty and education are interrelated. Um, uh, inequality and issues of inclusion and rights are interrelated with issues of health, agriculture, um, sustainable planetary boundaries, biodiversity, um, uh, basically the, the, the set of, um, uh, of goals that are the most urgent right now. These are quite similar in some respects to the Millennium Development Goals, the current set of goals, um, but they have a couple differences which I'll highlight as I uh, move through the next few um, slides. One question that we might ask is where is early childhood development um, in the current Millennium Development Goals? Um, it turns out that they were not included in those goals aside from the issues of infant mortality and maternal mortality. Now, why is it important? Why is it important for an issue of um, uh, the issue of young children to be represented? Um, it turns out that the goals that had strong advocacy and were included in, in the MDGs um, uh, experienced a lot of progress. Um, the world made um, quite a lot of substantial progress between 2000 and 2015 in areas like infant mortality. Um, in areas that were not highlighted and did not have effective advocacy and action behind them, like water and sanitation, for example, there's been much less progress. Um, and uh, uh, what is missing from the issues of infant and maternal mortality is the notion of what happens to children who survive. So uh, in the meantime, in the past 20 years, um, there's been a much stronger evidence base that has developed from economics, from neuroscience, from developmental science, developmental psychology, and from the evaluation sciences um, that support investment in early childhood. Um, in the Education for All goals, which are uh, an offshoot of the MDGs uh, uh, and related um, to them, uh, these are the world's education uh, goals that uh, UNESCO puts out an annual global monitoring report to monitor. Um, there was a focus on early childhood that we've had since 1990 to expand and improve early childhood care and education. Um, but there what uh, has been missing is the notion of devel developmental outcomes and learning, growth and uh, development. So um, in essence, there's some work around the definitions of these uh, um, issues. Unfortunately, the Open Working Group, which has been uh, working for about a year and a half, um, until a couple weeks ago, um, there was not a single mention of early childhood in any of their documents. Um, education, of course, was highlighted, both primary, secondary, tertiary education. Um, but we've had to um, quite aggressively try to make the case for why early childhood development deserves some mention in the global development goals. And so um, our thematic group on early childhood development and education um, prepared an issue brief uh, that I think might have been um, distributed to, to this class, I think. Um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, just so you have a sense of the kinds of, um, uh, I would say, a little bit more advocacy kind of language, even though it's uh, evidence-based, um, that we try to make to try to bring this onto an agenda where early childhood has no presence, um, we try to link it to these broader issues of sustainable development. We also try to link it to some of the current uh, evidence on what is the best way to communicate the importance of early childhood development. And certainly part of this is integrating um, work on the biological sciences and the notion of brain development and brain architecture. And I think um, uh, Leah Fernald last week might have talked about some of these issues. Um, some of this language, I'm not going to read it to you, is, was developed with the uh, input of communications firms, in particular one called the Frameworks Institute that worked with the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. Uh, when I was at Harvard, uh, I learned a lot from that center in terms of their savvy and taking the science 
of early childhood development, making sure that uh, basic scientists, um, neuroscientists, uh, developmental scientists, uh, <laughs> economists, um, uh, psychologists, and others uh, gave input into how phrases like brain architecture should be used if you were to try to communicate to policymakers why is early childhood uh, important as a period for investment. Um, and the notion that you really do need to talk a little bit about the complexity um, and the breadth of early childhood development across domains of physical, cognitive, language, social, and emotional development. And so I think this is, um, uh, these are some of the domains of development you'll be hearing uh, uh, more about um, uh, next uh, quarter as well. Um, in the issue brief, after we talk a little bit about the link to sustainable development and then this issue of the foundations of um, how children develop in the first years of life, we turn to the state of the world's young children. And a very influential article from The Lancet um, in 2007 that I recommend to you by Sally Grantham McGregor and colleagues, um, an interdisciplinary group that had this difficult task of trying to figure out how to quantify the notion of children at severe risk for um, loss of developmental potential, both during early childhood and later in life. So if we want to move beyond infant mortality and the idea that, um, uh, well, in fact, these days the majority of children actually survive um, past their first birthday, what are the notions of risk um, for later developmental problems that we should think about. So they came up with a number that has since become very famous since this was published in 2007, which is 200 million, which is the number of children under the age of five annually who are estimated to not reach their developmental potential. Now, how, um, how could they come up with a number so round? Uh, uh, how did they define this? Um, they looked for um, data that were available in as many countries as possible in low- and middle-income countries in particular, and uh, looked for uh, uh, data that were being collected consistently um, and that uh, represented serious risk to later development. And the two factors that they came up with, and I apologize, you probably can't see this, are stunting and exposure to extreme poverty, which is per capita income of less than $1.25 a day. So... Um, and using the available national data sets from a large number of countries, they were able to actually count up an estimate of the number of children under five uh, who are exposed to either stunting um, or extreme poverty or both. And um, ultimately, that total uh, comes out to about 200 million um, or 218 million children. Um, they are overrepresented in some regions of the world. And so the largest number proportionally come from Sub-Saharan Africa and from South Asia. Um, and so uh, um, you can see uh, more details on how this was calculated and um, the particular uh, regions and countries um, at risk in that article. Um, and I'd recommend also um, that set in 2007 had a couple other articles uh, uh, in this series in a special issue of The Lancet. And then in 2011, there was a follow-up, um, including an article with effective interventions to address um, the risks posed by uh, uh, what these 200 million children experience. Finally, in this issue brief, we talk a little bit about the benefits of investment in ECD, drawing on The Lancet 2011 series. Um, and estimates by Jerry Behrman, Melissa Drobo, uh, Sergio Sua, some other um, uh, economists who have looked at what extrapolating from the benefits, for example, of quality preschool education um, to understand what um, raising enrollment and access to early childhood education would result in in terms of benefits to society. Um, and some of you might have heard uh, uh, the number seven in Obama's State of the Union address both this year and last year as an estimate of the benefits from preschool education, quality preschool education in the United States. And that number comes from a famous study called the Perry Preschool 
study that was conducted in the late 60s where kids were followed up to the age of 40 and there were benefits as far as increased earnings, reduced teen pregnancy, reduced juvenile and adult crime, um, reduced uh, special education uh, referrals and grade retention. Um, but you'll notice that the benefit cost ratio here is higher. So it's estimated to be between 8 and 18. Um, so uh, you can see how um, a context of lower resources and perhaps greater risk to children's development, you might see a higher benefit cost ratio if you provide reasonable quality preschool enrollment um, in countries where, um, for example, the average enrollment um, in low-income countries of the world um, is uh, about 15 percent, so very, very low rates of access to even one year of pre-primary uh, education. Um, and uh, that's, that's the issue of pre-primary education for preschool-aged children, but of course zero to three is extremely important. And when there, um, uh, uh, well, across the whole period, a range of health and education and poverty reduction interventions are very important. The most famous example um, in the uh, global literature is a zero to two parenting program that was provided um, for children at risk of malnutrition and stunting in Jamaica where they have been following these kids for 20 years, um, following a rigorous randomized experiment, and finding that 20 years later, um, kids exposed to this program that uh, provided a strong approach to teaching uh, 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 moms in poverty um, how to engage in kind of cognitive stimulation with their children, as well as providing support for nutrition. That program produced um, 20 years later higher IQ, reduced anxiety, depression and violence, and 50% higher earnings. So we have some uh, uh, impressive results uh, emerging from this global ECD literature. So um, with uh, this and a lot of other work from the Global Early Childhood Committee, uh, uh, Community, um, the open working group that had not mentioned early childhood for months and months and months uh, finally did mention it in one little phrase of early childhood education being incorporated into their priority areas for the post-2015 goals. Um, so this is a small step forward and we're hoping um, that uh, uh, we'll be able to provide more input um, to them. So. Um, what is the actual goal that we uh, proposed from this group? Um, the overall goal is to ensure effective learning for all children and youth for life and livelihood. And rather than, you'll notice that the word education is actually not in there, um, but the focus has shifted um, somewhat from simply talking about access to education to learning outcomes. And this is a a pretty significant shift for the global education community from talking about uh, things, for example, like access to primary education to learning. And that's because um, despite the massive increase in access to primary education that's occurred in um, uh, developing countries, particularly low-income countries since 1990, um, there is not that much evidence that learning outcomes actually improve, that even basic literacy, um, uh, math skills, or let alone socio-emotional skills and the range of uh, 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 skills that we would like to see for children um, uh, growing up in today's world, uh, w there has not been much to move the needle on that despite um, increased access to primary education. Um, and that's partly for um, uh, reasons of uh, lack of emphasis, lack of sufficient emphasis really on quality. Um, and on trying to track what the learning outcomes uh, uh, of children actually are. And so um, the phrasing of this goal uh, was chosen to, to really put this explicit emphasis on learning uh, rather than so much on inputs, uh, traditional inputs, although those are also um, there. Um, then uh, within each goal, um, if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, they're structured this way. Each goal has um, a, a small number of targets, two or three targets, and each target has a set of indicators, uh, which are the kinds of indicators, essentially benchmarks, uh, for countries to collect, um, ideally on an annual basis in a way to kind of track the progress of their programs, national programs, 
and policies. The criteria for these indicators is that they should be measurable in a majority of UN member nations, ideally measured already, which is a, a fairly large constraint, um, which we can argue about. Um, this next set of goals is conceptualized to be relevant to high income countries, to rich countries, um, OECD countries, the US, not just low and middle income countries. Um, and that's partly if you place an emphasis on sustainability, um, certainly rich countries have as much responsibility, uh, if not more, um, uh, around issues of uh, uh, sustainability um, than just to say that that's a problem for poor countries. Then these criteria, these indicators, um, are, uh, need to be easy to understand and brief. Um, so we proposed a target on early childhood development, which states that all children under the age of five reach their developmental potential through access to quality early childhood development programs and policies. So this is a lot of people gave uh, input to this. We had every single word um, uh, argued over um, quite uh, a lot of times. Um, but we have only just gotten uh, in uh, the last couple weeks to a public report that has the uh, detailed indicators under each of these targets. Um, and this is the document uh, where we're actually still looking for public input until March 14th. So uh, it will be great to, um, so I'm going to take you through what some of these indicators are that are relevant to early childhood. Yeah, Michael? Great question. Um, uh, currently, so this was this was a real, uh, somewhat of a tough situation because folks in the global development world don't believe that it's measurable, and they think that the early childhood field is extremely weak because it doesn't have any agreed upon measurable indicators of what developmental potential is. So that's viewed as a weakness of the field. On the other hand, we're advocating for this to be included in measurement. So we went with um, uh, what exists currently and what is being measured currently in about uh, 80 to 90 countries, which is in the UNICEF Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey, uh, which is designed as a report instrument by adults. So first of all, it's not a direct child assessment, but it does cover domains of cognitive, physical, language and literacy, social and emotional domains of learning and development. It also only exists for three to five year olds. Um, so that's a big weakness. Um, currently there's work to develop new measures, both direct child assessments and better assessments from uh, caregivers and parents. Um, so uh, UNESCO and the World Health Organization are working um, as a follow up to an initiative at the Brookings Institution to really, um, and we have a meeting next uh, uh, week, that's a global meeting to kind of uh, figure out what the next direction is. But to warrant inclusion uh, and consideration by the Open Working Group, we had to really make the case for what we are already collecting. And that um, what we have, the best we have right now, which is not ideal, uh, but something that we can say is being collected in 80 to 90 um, primarily low-income countries is the UNICEF mix uh, data. But none of those series of disabilities, what is their developmental potential on a, on a range of kinds of things. To, to what degree, do, I mean, developmental potential and potential generally is attractive as a kind of moral goal. Uh, to what degree did you all debate whether having a goal that is not really operational individually, but you could have some standards uh, the long one may be problematic. Um, yeah, I think we, we went with um, a, a, the outcome of really a very long conversation in the early childhood field about how to talk about what the outcome is. And developmental potential, so for example, school readiness is something that we talk about a lot here in the US. Um, it is not understood uh, in the global context in quite a few countries. And 
Uh, some of the reactions have been, well, if a child is not ready, does that mean that that child does not have access to school? Um, so, yes, many other <laughs> phrases were considered. The Lancet Group, which is a group of about 20 leading global ECD researchers, um, had decided uh, after much debate in the mid-2000s to, to settle on this idea of developmental potential. It is partly also a rights-based perspective that is foreign to those in the U.S., right? So we're, we're talking about a framework that it fits with the U.N. Convention on the Rights of the Child that talks about the right of every child to fulfill his or her potential. Um, and so that's the kind of international rights-based language that we would perhaps, you know, I have to say developmental potential is not used in the U.S. as, as an outcome. We talk about school readiness in early childhood. Um, but, you know, all the, there have been many debates about school readiness as a, as a concept as well. So, um, so I, I absolutely agree. There's many phrases that could have been used. This is uh, one that um, was chosen because of some consensus among uh, uh, the global, so other groups as well, the consultative group on early childhood development uh, and others. Um, but it's a continuing conversation. The measurement issue is really critical. Um, and in our document, and I would love your and everyone's feedback on it, which we're still finalizing, which is the full report of the work group on early childhood development and education, uh, we have a section on measurement to talk through the different kinds of this is more of a monitoring instrument, which is absolutely different from an individual level screening instrument. And so we talk about the need and a couple examples of screening instruments, uh, the kinds of instruments that can track growth longitudinally over time, um, but then also these kinds of uh, general monitoring instruments. Uh, and, and they each have their different functions. The second indicator that's right under target 3A is the proportion of children receiving at least one year of a quality pre-primary education program. Here again, there's lots of different choices. Should we actually name a particular year of development? Primary education starts in a variety of years in a variety of countries. Um, and so this is what we uh, have chosen. That we're considering a secondary indicator for disadvantaged children of at least two years of uh, pre-primary education. Um, but what will be really important is whether the other indicators are disaggregated by age so that early childhood, so that, um, for example, you could disaggregate by age so that uh, countries are required to separate children from adults. And we could simply say, oh, you should have um, a, uh, some disaggregation so you understand how children 0 to 18 are doing <laughs> relative to adults. Um, but so we, uh, the network is providing some, some more fine-grained uh, indicators that hopefully would separate out um, specific developmental periods um, uh, from infancy to young adulthood. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that there will be some differentiation even within early childhood, for example, between birth and two, uh, when uh, most of the uh, uh, stunting uh, uh, develops in such a way that it becomes much harder to reverse um, after the age of two. Um, and then preschool age, which might be something like two to five. Um, assuming that there's age disaggregation, a whole variety of other indicators we've proposed um, have relevance for early childhood development. So if you go do go look at this document and provide um, feedback to the network, it will be great to look um, just to, uh, there's quite probably over 30 other indicators that are relevant, some that are relevant to ending extreme poverty, some that are about uh, family planning, some that are about um, equality and social inclusion, uh, which interestingly includes literally the right to be recognized um, uh, within a, a public state, which is birth registration. So many countries don't achieve 100% birth registration, uh, which means that there is no basis to say that you have the rights to access certain kinds of programs uh, or policies in that country. Um, a ton of, not a ton, but a range of health um, indicators that are important at all ages, but for which we think it's important to separate out early childhood. Um, and one uh, way in which this, this next set of sustainable development goals might be different from the NDGs is that there is a separation of rural and urban uh, development. Finally, one under goal eight, which is uh, largely about the risks that, for example, um, uh, uh, 
carbon burning cook stoves pose to, uh, uh, to families and young children. So um, again, if you go to unsdsn.org, there's, uh, uh, there's a form to provide feedback, which would be great. Okay, now moving ahead to some specific uh, studies, which are about um, how do you uh, uh, actually implement or improve the quality of a particular sector of early childhood development, which is early childhood education. I'm going to talk about two projects um, that I've been involved with, one in Chile and one uh, in Boston. And so these are uh, both efforts to evaluate quality improvement initiatives in early childhood education. So what is quality in early education? Um, these are not going to be that much of a surprise to most of you. Um, some of them are features of what we might call structural quality or what's been called structural quality. These are things like group sizes, adult-child ratios, the qualifications of staff. Um, others are more about the quality of interactions um, between adults and children. And so these are sometimes called process indicators, process quality indicators, they're things like a language-rich environment, warm and responsive adult-child interactions, and uh, uh, a, an additional um, critical issue, which is instructional quality, or um, the ability of teachers to foster specific kinds of skills uh, in young uh, kids. So if we um, look at the research on the quality of Chilean preschool classrooms, there's some reason to be concerned. Um, and this is true in um, practically every large-scale public system of preschool education in the world, um, including in the U.S., um, but in uh, really uh, far too many countries, which is that non-instructional activities um, take up an enormous amount of the classroom time. Uh, in Chile, these are things like eating snacks, teachers managing the kids' behavior, and recess time. Um, instructional activities are typically focused on um, unstructured conversations, and on average, um, uh, very little that supports rich language development. So um, this was a study by Kathy Strasser in um, four different systems of uh, preschool education for low-income families in Chile. Um, and she found on average that there was about five minutes per day of reading books with children, about one minute per preschool day of teaching the names or sounds of letters. So about uh, seven years ago, uh, we started a partnership with a foundation called the Fundación Educacional Oportunidad in uh, Santiago, um, a university there called the Universidad Diego Portales, um, and uh, a large stakeholder group made up of leaders of preschool education in four major preschool uh, systems in Chile, uh, one public and three private. Um, these are the major uh, auspices for early childhood education for low-income families in the country. And um, there were actually three phases of work. One was kind of stakeholder engagement and pilot program development. Uh, then a large um, randomized experiment to evaluate the impact of a teacher professional development program to improve the quality of um, preschool education in low-income neighborhoods in Santiago. And then I'm going to talk quite a bit uh, about a third phase that we've moved into, which is um, in the context of replication and expansion of the program, how do you um, uh, approach a process of continuous quality improvement of a program? Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, but first tell you um, what this uh, program does. So. Um, in the U.S., there's been uh, quite an exciting set of about 12 uh, controlled studies uh, in, I would say, the past 15 or 20 years that show the impact of coaching, which is on-site, in-classroom observation and feedback from a mentor or coach, um, and, the, and studies investigating the impact of that kind of coaching on the quality of classroom instruction as well as kids' learning. Um, this kind of approach is... Uh, never been implemented at large scale in uh, preschool education in South America. And so this was the first introduction of it. Um, it comes from the fact that uh, theories of adult learning suggest or you and I learn more when we're being observed in the workplace and someone that we trust is providing us feedback. So it's not supervision. 
Um, but the wonderful Spanish word for this um, that uh, uh, we use in our program is acompañamiento or accompaniment. Um, and so that's more the idea that instead of a supervisor coming in with a monitoring checklist, which is typical in, in many countries, to make sure that safety and class size and um, uh, you know, the structural features of quality are all meeting the national standards. Um, this is a very different approach where a, a teacher with extensive experience um, but someone who also has the skills to work collaboratively and establish rapport with teachers can enter um, a classroom uh, and engage in conversation both before and after that observation uh, with the teacher to discuss um, what the uh, mentor or coach is observing and um, uh, to really engage in a reciprocal conversation about how to improve practice. So this happens twice a month uh, in 12 monthly cycles in this program. Um, then these modules focus on uh, a variety of language and socio-emotional um, topics. You see uh, relatively more language. Um, this has a, a fairly strong language and literacy uh, focus to these modules. Um, however, um, it's very important uh, uh, that in this original program, there was no prescribed dosage. Um, that was kind of out of the question. Uh, uh, um, there was no tradition in Chile of what we might call a structured curriculum with suggestions, for example, of how often to read books to children or how often to engage in particular strategies. So what this was was a lighter kind of intervention where strategies were encouraged and coaches uh, came into the classroom to observe uh, uh, and facilitate the um, implementation of certain strategies. But these strategies were not, um, the teachers were not given guidance on how often uh, to implement the, these strategies during the course of a day or during the course of a week. So this is a large-scale ex, uh, experiment with 64 preschools randomly assigned um, to the full uh, Un Buen Comienzo model or a much reduced uh, alternative, which was essentially providing books to classrooms um, and one workshop. Uh, and so we were interested in whether Un Buen Comienzo improved process quality and child language outcomes. So um, to examine process quality, we videotaped class, um, preschool classrooms um, for a full preschool day. Uh, and um, we used a measure called the Classroom uh, Assessment Scoring System, or the CLASS. And we found that this measure had uh, very much uh, the same kind of structure that uh, it does in North America, which is three subscales. Uh, one, emotional support, the second, um, classroom organization, that should say, um, and the third, instructional quality. Um, after one year of intervention, this is a two-year teacher professional development program. Um, this is for both four-year-old pre-K classrooms and five-year-old kindergarten um, classrooms. So uh, teachers experience this as a two-year intervention, but so do children. Um, we found uh, a large effect on emotional support of about 0 0.8. Um, 0 0.8 is actually the, the kind of standard for what a large effect um, is. And moderate effects on uh, classroom organization and instructional support. After two years, um, and this is a different set of teachers for the most part, um, these were the effect on emotional support looked a little smaller, uh, about a, a 0.38 effect classroom uh, uh, organization about the same effect in year one, but a much smaller effect on instructional um, support. Disappointingly, we did not find uh, uh, an effect on language outcomes overall for the sample. Um, but one of the things we found was that there were high levels of absenteeism um, in preschool classrooms in Chile. So uh, what we did was we actually went in um, this happens in many cases in many educational systems around the world. If you um, go in and look at the enrollment sheet, you, s you might see 25 children listed as being in the classroom. But four or five of them might be children who don't exist um, because these schools uh, receive some subsidies for the number of children that they serve that are at risk um, uh, uh, economically or socially, according to the Chilean national system of how to identify risk. Um, and so we went in and actually observed classrooms on randomly selected days, um, 10 days throughout the year. 
And what we found was that on any given day, about one quarter of the children weren't there. And if you followed any given child over the course of the year, that child typically missed um, about a quarter of uh, the classes. So if you actually um, then focused on the subset of kids who we could say received this intervention by attending um, preschool uh, consistently, there we saw some hints that the uh, effects were moving in the right direction um, for a couple of our language outcomes for letter word identification and emergent writing. But uh, we wanted to really see what was going on, what was explaining the fact that uh, we saw some moderate-sized effects on observed classroom quality, but um, not much in terms of children's actual outcomes. So um, the great thing about having videotaped data is that you can kind of go back and recode them. Um, and there have been um, two or three different recoding uh, studies, including one on vocabulary instruction strategies, one on what happens during book reading episodes. Um, but the one I'm going to show you is about the fidelity of implementation of uh, the program. So um, coding was done minute by minute across um, the 80 minutes of uh, segments that were used to code the class instrument to capture the predominant activity in the classroom um, each minute. And so we uh, looked at both the kinds of literacy strategies that were targeted and meant to be increased by Un Buen Comienzo uh, around print knowledge, vocabulary, emergent writing, and oral comprehension, but also non-targeted literacy strategies, the kind of things that you see when you walk into a typical Chilean uh, uh, public preschool classroom, which are oral routines, which might be kind of repetition of syllables, um, conversation about a theme but without elaboration, um, isolated phonemic awareness or um, something like drawing after listening to a story. Uh, and when we look at what happened, um, these are literally the number of minutes uh, uh, out of those 80 minutes um, in both the comparison group and the treatment group or the full Umbuen Comienzo group. And so um, uh, at pretest, um, that's at point one on this. Uh, on the left, there's no significant difference, but we do see um, differences emerge at the end of year one and at the end of year two. But you notice these are from very low means. So the control group means are roughly about eight minutes of the kinds of literacy strategies that we would like to see occur, moving up by about five minutes to 12 at the end of year one, and a small increase of about four minutes uh, in, at the end of year two. Um, and the correspondingly, um, uh, reductions in non-targeted strategies. These are things like oral routines. So um, a, a, a reduction meaning in effect in the opposite direction, uh, reducing the number of minutes of um, those kinds of uh, a syllable repetition and those kinds of things um, uh, in the experiment. So um, this raised, uh, in the meantime, something happened, which was in the middle of the experiment, there was an opportunity to expand the program to another region. And so before knowing the results of the experiment, we faced a dilemma. Um, there was an opportunity in that the Ministry of Education in the region, uh, that experiment was in the capital of Santiago, uh, and the region just south of Santiago that is more rural uh, expressed interest. And so we had um, long discussions with our partners about what to do. And we decided that we would um, go ahead and test uh, this program in a new context, but to um, and retain its core approaches, but to take a different approach so that it didn't um, have the characteristics that we often see with a curriculum, for example, being introduced into a new school system here in the U.S., which is that uh, you know, your, your modal response is that you just wait for the curriculum to go away and for the next one to come in, but you don't really change your practice. So we wanted to have a process that would motivate and involve all the different stakeholders that might be involved, uh, from parents to teachers to uh, principals to regional ministry staff and the coaches. Um, we also wanted to make specific improvements, um, improve attendance, intensify dosage, um, intensify the components where in the original intervention there was no possibility of prescribing dosage, would there be a possibility to build the motivation to improve the quality in these specific areas? And so we used a model that has been used in healthcare um, quite a lot um, all around the world, which is a particular approach from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
and applied it for the first time uh, in early childhood development and specifically in the domain of early childhood education. Um, so uh, this approach um, uh, was developed to, um, well, it actually came out of the corporate world. It came out of um, a lot of the kind of famous approaches to quality improvement um, in sectors like the auto industry um, in the 1970s. Um, but it uh, had, has been applied for uh, roughly the past 25 years or so to try to improve healthcare systems, um, to do things like reduce the amount of errors um, that cause needless uh, injury or death, um, and to improve the, the quality of implementation of specific services. Um, it is an approach that involves all stakeholders in the conceptualization, measurement, and implementation of quality improvement strategies. Um, it has recently moved into the U.S. educational system through a large RFP from the U.S. Department of Education and is being championed by Tony Breik at the Carnegie uh, Foundation for the Advancement of Learning. Um, and uh, in our conversations with him, we didn't, uh, he didn't know that, we, and we didn't know about his initiative and he didn't know about ours, but we had happened to come through it because our health director of our program knew uh, some of the folks at the Institute on Healthcare Improvement and so brought this initiative and we agreed that it would be a wonderful model to try. Um, uh, the short, uh, uh, the upshot is that this has had a tremendously positive response from uh, the stakeholders uh, in this new region of Chile. Um, the core of this approach is what's called Rapid Plan, Do, Study, Act cycles or PDSA cycles, which are um, groups of stakeholders coming together and collaboratively deciding what is the specific aspect of this program we would like to work on and improve over the next three months, what is the change and what is it concretely that we would see and that we can observe and actually measure on a daily or weekly basis, um, and how do we implement those, uh, and, and let's do that for the next three months, uh, and then come back uh, in three months. So that these are these three-month cycles. Um, the, the sessions when the stakeholders come together are called learning sessions. Um, this is supplementing the coaching, um, and the idea is to create change at scale. Um, who are the stakeholders? They are um, this full set of uh, folks, um, uh, including the coaches, the parents, municipal uh, uh, departments, folks from the departments of education and health, um, uh, from our municipalities. Um, and uh, what's been interesting is to see this process in action. Um, it has um, taken what have been very isolated preschool teachers, for example, both isolated within their schools but isolated in rural areas who often um, might go a month without having a conversation about their work with anybody. And um, the, the response has been um, pretty overwhelming for some of them uh, to the degree that this is emotionally producing a lot more meaning in their daily uh, uh, work lives. Um, both during the learning sessions, but also in between when they're collecting the data from measures that they themselves have developed to track improvements. Um, so just to give you an idea of what kind of measures, um, these are not researchers coming in and providing measures of quality improvement. These are the stakeholders coming up with the measures themselves. This was a, um, uh, everyone was realizing uh, attendance was a problem. Um, the first thing you do is you set a concrete quantifiable goal um, in this case, to increase the attendance of preschool children from roughly 75% of school days to 90% of school days. And these are kids kind of putting their own uh, uh, little chits that represent um, their own attendance uh, in a kind of public display in the classroom. Um, then these data are collected. Um, this happens to be in Excel, but it doesn't require any technology, so it could be done on simply a, a, a paper and pencil. And so what happens is um, the x-axis is uh, actual days. Um, and so this is tracked every day by the teacher. Um, and uh, the teacher makes interpretations at, uh, and, uh, at the learning sessions about why it dipped in these days or what, what happened here that made possible um, uh, that increase during uh, those particular days. Another example from our health component um, from uh, a set of schools that decided to work on eliminating sugar-sweetened beverages. Anyone here from Chile? Yes. Um, uh, have you ever had unsweetened milk in Chile? It's sweet, yes. So it's impossible to actually have milk without tons of sugar in it. 
Um, and typically, uh, kids would come to school with sweetened uh, milk, or that would be served. Um, and so this was to eliminate um, sugar-sweetened beverages and to replace all that sugar, actually, with drinking water. And so the measure that was created for this, uh, which is a test of change water, is what it says here, is a very cute uh, 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 measure uh, each kid's. The, uh, literally, the number of drinks of water that they take instead of soda um, become the measure, and, uh, and a bead is placed um, to keep track of that. Um, and so this was... Uh, um, the percentage of children who brought um, uh, sweetened juice or soda to school declining dramatically, really within the span of about less than a week, and then the number of drinks of water during um, uh, uh, a particular day. Um, again, tracked every day. So... Um, Another example of a goal is to increase from that roughly 12 minutes a day to about 30 minutes per day of evidence-based, those uh, UBC language and literacy strategies. Um, and we keep collecting data. So we keep collecting the same measures of children. We keep collecting the um, class observational quality data. And now um, this is not a randomized experiment. We use quasi-experimental methods. Um, but we have some suggestion that maybe we're starting to get um, larger effects in the direction that we um, uh, would like to see. And so the question is with can scaling, where, which we typically associate with a dilution of impacts, can it actually improve a program if we combine it with this continuous quality improvement strategy? Um, so that's a traditional kind of scale strategy where you take a small demonstration program and you start scaling it up. Um, and we can talk uh, more about the methods. We're trying to figure out what the methods are for the next phases of scale for that uh, program. Another one is to take an existing system that's already at scale and to try to improve the quality. And here's um, a brief example from Boston, and then I'll just uh, 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 conclude. Um, so Boston um, uh, is a, a city that started implementing a universal preschool program, exactly the kind of uh, policy that's being uh, proposed now for the U.S. Um, and also for particular cities like New York or Seattle or San Antonio. Um, and I've heard there are some conversations moving ahead for the state of California for the first time in a very long time. Um, and so there was a lot of um, expansion. Um, some uh, aspects of the system where you would expect high quality, BA teachers being paid at a K-12 uh, scale. Um, and yet, uh, the director of early childhood, Jason Sachs, in 2008, um, had um, the quality of the system uh, observed um, of 40 randomly sampled classrooms using the class and the Eckers, another uh, very uh, often used um, early childhood quality um, observation. And it was found that the, the level of quality was really um, poor to mediocre. That actually made it onto the front page of the Boston Globe. Um, and so the decision, a very key decision was made to stop the expansion and take that money and actually invest it in quality improvement. And so what uh, Jason did was after consultation with a variety of folks, choose evidence-based language and math curricula, the OWL for language and building blocks for math for district-wide implementation. Um, this is the same theme of coaching. Um, so implemented in-classroom coaching supports with one set of coaches uh, supporting two curricula and visits to classrooms either weekly or every two weeks, um, depending on the needs of the teacher. And so uh, Christina Weiland and I um, did a study to look at what are the causal impacts of um, BPS's at scale preschool program on children's language, the pre-literacy, their math. Um, and we were also interested to see whether um, if there were language and math effects, whether there might be what we might call spillover effects onto executive function. Um, dimensions, and so aspects of self-regulation and attention that we know are now uh, quite important uh, as roots of um, later cognitive and socio-emotional development. So um, unlike prior uh, studies of curricula and coaching, um, uh, this was one done at scale, and so that's why uh, we thought it was a particularly important um, uh, to look at it in Boston. The other public pre-K evaluations in the United States, including Tulsa, including um, probably about 10 or 11 states. Um, uh, in none of those contexts has there been a single curriculum that's being implemented. And in uh, uh, none of them 
um, except for I think New Jersey, has there been uh, coaching uh, and this kind of in-classroom uh, mentoring and observation going on. So what we found uh, was the largest effects on language and math of public preschool to date in the US. And so these are um, moderate, verging on large effects on vocabulary, on uh, early decoding skills, on uh, numeracy, and on a more comprehensive assessment of math developed by Doug Clements. And we were um, uh, happy to see um, a consistent um, smaller, uh, which we might expect because these skills weren't directly targeted, um, but positive effects on all three domains of executive function, working memory inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility. And we also found that this universal program, which means that it was provided to non-poor families as well as poor families, um, uh, produce large reductions in disparities. Um, so it reduced disparities substantially by class, measured by um, uh, free or reduced lunch, or not free or reduced lunch, um, as well as by um, race. And it actually completely eliminated the disparities between Latino and white students in, in their early literacy and math skills. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to solve all problems forever, because we know that more disadvantaged groups are more likely to go on to poorer quality schools. And so what Jason Sachs has done is already started to implement a kindergarten curriculum that is based on the, this very high quality preschool. And in future years, we'll be extending that up to um, third grade. And another expansion he's doing is to expand it beyond the school district into community provider systems like Head Start or small community providers to provide the same set of curriculum and coaching supports um, to community providers. Um, there's a video I'm not going to show because Greg, and, uh, uh, Greg Duncan and Dick Murnane might are, are likely to show it uh, in, a, in a few weeks um, when they talk about their book, Restoring Opportunity, in their, the part of that book that talks about preschool. Okay, so um, what are the principles of quality improvement in early childhood education at scale? Um, Evidence-based curriculum and coaching supports now have support from about 12 controlled studies that are small scale, and then this one big test in Boston. Um, Engaging stakeholders in the mission of quality improvement, uh, we found in Chile, motivates them. Uh, it, it gets folks to be, on a daily basis, connected to the reason why they went into that field. And this, we think, is one of the more kind of uh, moving as well as um, exciting um, aspects of this continuous quality improvement model. Um, in the next stages of um, scale in Chile, uh, we're thinking of a fuller transition to public ministry uh, staff implementing the entire intervention, um, drawing mentors and coaches not from a core group in Santiago, um, but from uh, regional teachers and the teacher workforce. Um, and that's a, that's a great big challenge. Um, that's the next level of scale there. Um, but we think it's key to maintain networks where um, at some of the learning sessions you might see uh, a regional ministry person interacting with a parent, um, there really being no kind of hierarchical division. Everyone's working together to set the goals for quality improvement and for how to measure that um, improvement. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, I have studies. Sometimes I describe other studies, and <laughs> they're not in this presentation, so I apologize uh, for that. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions if we have. I don't know how much time we have left. Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. Yes, back there. Right. 
Yeah, so the, the question is what is the funding, um, uh, what are the funding sources for the coaching piece? And so um, right now this is actually um, just being worked out and figured out in the context of um, well, at least two cities, Seattle and New York, um, uh, right now. Um, so both cities have, in essence, passed in a, you know, the, the legislation or the agreement to, to, to implement universal pre-K. Um, but the lesson from this literature and where researchers can, uh, can draw attention to successes is, is uh, these coaching models. And um, unfortunately, what we lack is really accurate economic cost data on exactly how much a coaching system costs. Jason Sachs calculates it as actually 0.1 FTE of a coach per classroom. Um, but then uh, in the expansion of universal pre-K, you have to also take into account capital improvement costs, um, the costs of the curricula and the materials, and uh, all of those kinds of things. Now, um, uh, per child, um, current um, public pre-K programs cost anywhere from about 9,000, you know, these are kind of the, the successful ones, about $9,000 per child in Tulsa to about $14,000 per child in the Abbott preschools in New Jersey. Um, we think Boston is somewhere on the higher end of those, in part because salaries are higher and it's a high cost of living city. These are also very qualified. Boston is kind of a hyper-educated city as well, um, but it also has a system where teachers are, are very much encouraged and expected to get masters after a few years. They come in with BAs, but they're actually expected to get uh, further uh, degree qualifications. So we had an unusually highly educated mentor and teacher workforce. Um, in Boston. Um, but in Boston, it's about 12 classrooms per mentor. In Chile, it's just about the same. Um, uh, if you go up to something like 30 classrooms per mentor, you're not getting, I think, that, that regular interaction that constitutes a good working relationship. So, um, so uh, I think this this kind of range of 12 to 15 classrooms per mentor across these studies is pretty important. But if you work that out to child by, on a per child basis, you can just do this in your head. Um, it's, it's, you can understand that coaching, uh, while it might be more expensive than the existing professional development in the system, hopefully wouldn't add an enormous additional cost per child. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that um, many public preschool systems in the U.S. spend quite a lot of money on professional development. Um, we have no evidence that mo most of that works at all um, because they're, they're workshop and didactic based and they're typically not coaching uh, based. Um, all that to say that you know, we still have to kind of work out exactly what the added cost of coaching is. It's a great Great question. We're trying. We're now doing the full cost analysis of the Boston Pre-K program, but it's complicated. Peggy. Yeah, um, I think in systems that are expanding really rapidly, uh, um, well, this is an issue in every system that the higher ed uh, system needs to take that into account. Um, the question of which kinds of approaches that are very similar to this, so integrating a coaching system into practica in teacher training um, is a question that I think is really important that needs to be answered. 
Um, New York is certainly, New York right now is doing everything at once in time for a September start. It's a little chaotic. But they are uh, uh, intentionally meeting with the deans of the major schools that provide um, uh, training in early childhood across the entire city to try to get input, to try to understand how major leading institutions like Bank Street are, are going to be uh, responding to the increase um, in hiring. Uh, so, so I'm glad you raised it because it, it, is, it is a huge issue. We don't have uh, sufficient research on this. But the only recommendation I would make is to integrate the same kind of on-site um, uh, in-classroom observation and support into the practica. Um, and I, I think some places do that, but not all. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's probably a limitation uh, of the program. The uh, the task of changing the institutions there, where the training from uh, all the everything we heard from teachers was that it's entirely theoretical and not classroom based, and so there are no classroom experiences. So that would mean a major change um, in the curricula of uh, teacher training as it exists in Chile, and I would say in in, in other countries at least in South America, that uh, uh, we've observed. But. Yeah, back there. So, uh, one of the many things that I thought was interesting is the New York quality improvement and involving stakeholders. And I was wondering, I have a couple questions. I mean, uh, do you have any things that you've learned that work particularly well, or anything that you do um, differently, or are you curious about that with your experience in New York? And then um, if you have a chance to do Um, so when you're asking plans to, I think the question was about plans to improve the, yeah, the system of quality? Plan, do you study actions, cycles, what type of, of research, what, what, what type of cycles and, and approaches? Yeah, I, I think, um, so uh, Tony Brake is, uh, uh, certainly has, um, uh, organi has, has a couple large projects on this, one around math, one around something else. Uh, uh, across districts and is putting together a network of, of people and the U.S. Um, IES, uh, Institute on Educational Sciences, is funding um, a chunk of, uh, of these kinds of programs and it's kind of John Easton's initiative there as commissioner of uh, IES um, to try to really bridge uh, research with practice. I think there's a lot of research questions there about um, the degree to which for example, um, when there is more rapid change in these tests of change on a day-to-day -day basis, do we see that reflected in some of these more global measures of quality? Um, is that related? And, and we're planning to look at that um, because we have both class data as well as the metric um, data from, from Chile. It's complicated because schools are working on different goals. Um, and the question is, how do you use uh, that data? But those are some of the questions that we'd be interested in. I think there's a lot of interesting qualitative work to be done on, on, on what, what makes for the more successful kinds of learning sessions. Um, how can those be scaled up um, if you need particular specialized facilitation of those uh, learning sessions? Um, and uh, at least in that region of Chile, they are now expanding that system into all K-12 approaches to quality improvement so that um, uh, getting quality improvement funds in that region, you, have, you now have to use this model. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how it works in other, uh, in other systems. Yep, back right there. Yeah, we um, looked at that uh, in the Boston data, and I think there, there was a small association, positive association, 
um, with quality for those with an early childhood specific degree. Um, we know from the literature, though, that the teacher qualifications have only a weak association uh, with observed quality and child outcomes. And so those kinds of features are important. I think on some issues, they're extremely important. So one of the issues is that um, uh, when you have a system in which uh, teachers who teach preschool can teach children one or two years older and double their salaries, um, that is creating uh, a system that is designed to have high teacher turnover. Um, so I do think the parity issue is really important. The parity issue is also not simply about degrees. Um, so for example, Head Start systems that require BAs, uh, the teachers, they still lose teachers to school um, district-based systems because the benefits are better. Um, uh, same degree, uh, you know, higher salary and better benefits. So we have quite a lot of disparities, um, as you know. In, in and then the community providers are a whole other situation where they have even typically less in terms of benefits, uh, in, in terms of salaries, and those kinds of things. So, yeah. Prudence. Kinds of school. But are there any plans to see if there are sustained or long term effects for these high quality uh, early childhood programs? Sure, yeah, no, that's a huge, huge controversial uh, area, but really, really important, right? So, um, yeah, so we have a grant proposal in right now to IES around the long term uh, follow up of the Boston study. The way the study, uh, the study design regression discontinuity makes, it's not a typical randomized experiment. It's not as simple as following the two groups over time, but essentially it was leveraging the fact that one, one group, uh, they missed the birthday cutoff, and so they didn't enter preschool until the year after, right? So, so it's when you have two groups that are going at different, so it's a, you have to use these quasi-experimental approaches, but it's still worth doing, and in Tulsa they did it um, and found some sustained effects at, at third grade. In our meta-analysis that uh, Greg Duncan, Catherine Mangus, and Holly Schindler and I have been doing for a very, very long time, because <laughs> it takes so long to gather these studies, uh, but one of the studies we did was to look at what is the rate of this quote-unquote fade-out per year, right? Like how many effect sizes per year are lost on average from a, uh, a post, uh, you know, right after the preschool year kind of effect. On average, it's about 0.03 effect size is um, lost per year. So if you're starting with an effect of 0.3, it will reduce to zero in uh, 10 years. But you might say that it goes to something that you don't really, is no longer kind of a substantial effect after a shorter period of time. With this size of effects, um, if, if the rate doesn't depend on the size of the initial effect, then a, a larger post-test effect should simply last longer. Um, but we also know that it does depend a great deal on the quality of the subsequent schooling. So um, Sibel, if she doesn't talk about it, I can say <laughs> an effect that she's found, which is in her study of, uh, in Chicago of a socio-emotional curriculum for the children, you know, positive effects on reduced behavior problems um, and improved self-regulation. But when the children subsequently went on to the poorest quartile of schools, those effects were lost um, by, I think, fifth grade. Um, they were sustained for the kids who went on to high quality schools. So we do need more of those kinds of studies, but more actually of the stuff to do, right? So the, the actual integrated or at least aligned um, uh, curriculum and coaching supports um, to follow up preschool. Um, the, the other issue about fade out is um, in, in the overall literature, why do we see some long-term effects and yet this kind of quote unquote fade out, right? Um, so there's, there's some puzzles around that. Um, one of the issues is that uh, it's not total fade out in the sense that we typically see grade retention and special ed referral reductions uh, from preschool exposure. And so those are kind of things that are medium term effects that are really quite consistent in the literature. Um, and then what we see fade out on is, is test scores. So you know, the, the kind of typical standardized reading and math 
score. So there's a lot of questions about what are some of the other uh, uh, motivational engagements, uh, socio-emotional kinds of outcomes that might be um, attention, executive function. We don't really know whether there are medium-term effects. We, do, we just don't have enough of those kinds of studies. So th that's a real big priority for us to understand. You know, since there have been you know, more than two or three studies that show some evidence of these long-term effects, uh, what is going on in between? Yeah. And, and then what are the characteristics of school systems that can sustain this kind of initial boost that a high-quality preschool program can provide? So, yeah. Peggy? So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Any other questions? It's a great question. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk and participating uh, session. We thank uh, Dr. Chikawa one more time. Thank you. Thank you.